Hi everybody. Welcome to this uh, video. Today I have a very special guest with me. Um in fact, leopards are one of my favorite big cats and I've been uh, fortunate to observe leopards in India, Africa, Sri Lanka and also some kinds of uh, similar to leopard animals like the jaguars and stuff like that. But I have somebody here with me who is uh, a conservation scientist. I have been always talking to photographers, but today I think I want to have a conversation with a very eminent personality um he's a very celebrated conservation scientist uh his name is mr sanjay gubbi namaskara sir namaskara. hello so uh mr sanjay gubbi uh works for nature conservation foundation as a senior scientist i have a long list of accolades that i want to tell you about him i think it will not be enough to introduce you in an hour but i'll try my best he is basically a masters in conservation biology at the Durrell Institute of Conservation and Ecology Kent in UK he's also uh, won a best postgraduate uh, award by it's called the Morris Swingland prize right so that was fantastic and then he's also um, he also has a phd on leopard ecology has won several awards amongst which the uh, conservation award by the Carl Zeiss uh, company has been uh, very eminent he was also named um, one among the 25 leaders of tomorrow by times of india i think in 2012 uh, a couple of more awards that makes him so special the coexistence award by the elephant family and the whitley award which is also known as the green oscars sir this is a fantastic profile i'm very privileged to have you and new kannada doro i'll be very um, honored to talk to you for a few minutes and uh, uh, welcome to this chat thank you jayant it's a pleasure to come to to hold and also talk to a uh, very eminent photographer and a very acclaimed photographer like you uh, especially somebody who has a conservation ethic as well so it's a pleasure being with you jayant thank you sir thank you very much sir uh, i have a list of questions that i'd love to ask you but uh, before that i would love to know a little bit about your early days your background i know uh, your surname says sanjay gubbi and uh, i had relatives in tumkur so i am guessing that's the <laughs> that's the place where you are from so there you to please tell us a little bit about your early uh, childhood and maybe even education and stuff like that how do nano tumkur jilla gubbi ano i am from a place called gubbi fantastic and i have uh, grown up mostly in the rural parts of karnataka bangalore is a completely new place to me mm -hmm. i have come to bangalore very recently but uh, uh, that upbringing and growing up in rural parts of karnataka made me understand the socio political aspects of our society right so when you do conservation when you are into wildlife conservation on ground conservation uh, you need to understand society very well conservation is not just about animals and not just about wildlife you need to understand society you need to understand politics you need to understand economics you need to understand a large variety of issues that impact conservation right so that upbringing of the, Uh, in intentional or an unintentional up or coincidental upbringing mm -hmm. gave me a good base to do conservation in this uh, in this country right so and then um, i i mostly studied in kannada medium oh then i grew up and then i did a uh, my undergraduate was in fact in electrical engineering oh fantastic and mm -hmm. then uh, it was not something which i really enjoyed <laughs> so i went and quit my job and uh, did my <laughs> joined into conservation right. but conservation was always my passion right uh, because right from my high school days when i was in scouting movement right it exposed me to a lot of outdoors you know bird watching camping you know trekking nature trails all these things and that put a very solid um, uh, interest in me about nature right so from then onwards you know i graduated into watching birds and then i went to nagarole you know way back in the mid 80s wow and i was very fascinated about the large mammals the number of large mammals you see in that place right then i graduated into understanding and uh, uh, watching and studying large mammals fantastic so i quit my uh, engineering profession and then did my masters Fantastic. and then my phd in leopards right so did you drop out of engineering or did you oh you were working as an engineer is it yeah but you know you use the right term i dropped out of engineering oh, at one point of time <laughs> and i went to kokrebellur that oh. was my first job in wildlife conservation or wildlife science right uh, for a year and a half i was in kokrebellur studying right. uh, painted stork and um, spot billed pelicans fantastic but i soon realized that even to do wildlife biology even to be a conservationist i needed a basic degree oh okay so i came back completed my engineering i see did, you know continued to work as an engineer right. but because it was not 
uh, it was not something which was in my heart mm-hmm. then um, i just discussed with my family and shifted completely into conservation sir interesting question when you say you needed was that an academic requirement or did you really feel you needed a degree i really needed a felt that i needed a degree for various purposes right, right. you know if you want to also grow in the academic field of you know conservation biology sure. you need to have a basic degree then you need to do a masters then you know pe- you're also expected to do your phd right. and then you write scientific papers sure um to grow up all this uh, along this graph you certainly needed an undergraduate degree Absolutely. great so i i i was determined that i should go up that uh, complete that as well fantastic thank you for answering that so um you have worked with the uh, wildlife conservation society in the past and currently you're with ncf for a reasonable amount of time so can you please tell us a little bit about your work and what kind of projects you are involved with uh, presently see i don't do projects oh i see okay wildlife conservation is not projects okay it's not project based right it's a, it's a continuous process you right. know all through your life mm-hmm. if you look at any of the older generation wildlife conservationists they never retire mm. so project i think is a wrong terminology to use okay. in the field of wildlife conservation sure mm. it's a continuous process ongoing process and it goes with you right. uh, you know wherever you end up right. in your life right so i work on conservation of large mammals mostly large cats mm-hmm. i work on conservation of tigers mm-hmm. uh, studying leopards right. understanding their behavior mm-hmm. but my interest comes from applied conservation so whatever i study mm. about these animals mm-hmm. should finally end up in conserving these species right. it could be leopards it could be tigers right. and a by product of our work should will also help lot of other animals like elephants dholes right. you know pangolin uh, masir fish for example sure. so we use umbrella species but it impacts a whole ecosystem all right sir thank you very much so um as a scientist and uh, you know uh, somebody who is into conservation i have a very interesting question for you which is something which i wanted to ask personally um i have met a lot of scientists and biologists and marine biologists and stuff like that somewhere i got a feeling as a naive wildlife enthusiast that they do a lot of research they do a lot of uh, study on things that we can't even imagine um now is it actually reaching um a stage where those you, you mentioned that you want to make sure whatever you have done and studied should be used for conservation right so uh, when you say scientific community is researching working does majority of the uh, search and research and findings get implemented into some kind of a um what can i say is it used to actually conserve wildlife or you know ecology and stuff like that or is it a lot of academic work some part of it is also conservation work see academics is very important to understand the behavior of animals the ecology how the ecosystems functions all those are very important but ultimately you should be marketing your own product in our field right so the if you want the government which is a main stakeholder in wildlife conservation to listen to you mm-hmm. you have to take your research findings to the government and explain it to to them in a manner in a simplified manner that they understand right. and uh, they see a benefit to the society from the research we do sure otherwise you know for a commercial product like a lens or a camera mm-hmm. you have large corporates who are going to market their product because they have invested on development of the product and that's the the ultimate goal is to reach the market the, to reach the masses right but unfortunately wildlife conservation you have to be your own representative marketing representative for your product right, right. so um, as ecology as ecologists people would some people would like to stay with science mm-hmm. with academics mm-hmm. some people would like to go beyond that right uh, which is the stream i have uh, selected right. because i think you know at the end of the day when whenever i retire or mm. whenever we retire or we think we will retire mm-hmm. uh, if i turn back and see mm-hmm. uh, that's my personal ethic again right. um i should not feel that hey the tigers or leopards or elephants all these animals gave me so much in my life today mm. whatever i am right. and whatever i possess is because of this these animals right did i do justice to these animals mm. so mm. if i look back i should go and sleep and the day i retire very mm. comfortably very mm. peacefully right. thinking whatever little i did certainly benefited these species so right. it's a personal ethic but it's uh, it's different for different people wonderful sir thank you very much Um one of the things I admire about you is uh, you've done a lot of work and you know you you've been an author of quite a few books um six books 
uh, so far and some of them are still upcoming like uh, i know that you've told me that leopard diaries are upcoming um as i was telling in the introduction leopards are my favorite cats um in every place that i've observed leopards um it gives me a different pleasure when i see them on the trees so um one important thing about your books was you know it's though you use the term saving tiger landscapes in the 21st century for our viewers i just want you to explain how um when you say a tiger um landscape you probably mean everything else under the umbrella so uh, tell us about this interesting book i'd love everybody to re- i mean read this book it's a great book for uh, anybody interested in conservation to an extent because uh, it's probably easy for a common man to understand as well uh, would you like to tell something about this uh, beautiful book of yours it's actually called second nature saving tiger landscapes in the 21st century mm. you know the idea for me was to write this book was not to write just about the beautiful animals we have mm-hmm. but what goes behind the scene to save these animals right if tomorrow if somebody wanted to do conservation i wanted to say that there's a lot of positivity even in conservation otherwise mm. the field of wildlife conservation is very gloom and doom right. you know everybody is talking wildlife is going tiger numbers are going down great indian bustard numbers have really gone down elephants are into great conflict with people leopards are being killed on a daily basis either on the roads or by due to poaching or due to retaliatory killing mm-hmm. all this is happening yes it's very much true right but if you did the right thing at the right time mm-hmm. using the right tools mm-hmm. conservation can can also end up with a lot of success stories right that's what this book is talking about second sure. nature sure um it's talking about success stories mm-hmm. but it also talks about how these success stories came about in the state of karnataka mm-hmm. it was not just pure magic that karnataka has the largest number of elephants or Absolutely. tigers in this country right. or we also have the largest number of lion tailed macaques right. um all these things didn't happen overnight it right. happened due to various factors it happened due to the efforts of forest department it happened due to wonderful political leadership it happened due to conservationist intervention 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 of the conservationists right so many things media supported it right. in a big manner right. so so many people contributed to this mm-hmm. uh, aspect right so uh, it's about showing positivity about conservation mm-hmm. you know it's not all uh, 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 you know lost uh, like rome right. it is still possible to have wildlife in this country if you sure. did the right things they say right uh, optimism is the first uh, ingredient for a conservationist so right but one question in all the list of uh, contributions from you know you said forest department media and all of that uh, do you think there's been any um, even a small contribution from wildlife enthusiasts because karnataka seems to have a huge chunk of them in this country ha- have they been of any um, real support or are they moral support at least what do you think of uh, karnataka's wildlife enthusiasts absolutely i was a wildlife enthusiast right. i didn't come into this field as a scientist right. i didn't i never dreamt of becoming a scientist i always dreamt of being a conservationist right there's a huge difference between being a scientist and a conservationist correct i just metamorphosized to being also being a scientist right so even right. today by heart i am a conservationist and right. not a scientist actually to sure. be very honest so why people who have been interested in wildlife have done great contribution to conservation not just in karnataka right. but in this country sure. you know passion is more important you know right. and you come to this field because of that you know that uh, drive in your heart mm-hmm. not because you have a degree True. so conservation enthusiasts have done wonderful job in this country and i hope they'll carry on this mantle in the future i have no doubts about that absolutely sir uh, one more book of yours um, it's a kannada book shalege banda chirte mattu itara kathegalu it's my favorite because one is it's kannada <laughs> yeah. and two is um, for some of you viewers who might not probably have seen mr gubbi before um in uh, 2016 there was a viral video all over the internet about a leopard that strayed into a school in i think the east of bangalore somewhere and uh, amongst hundreds of people there how did the leopard end up on you and i saw you being mauled by the leopard i think for a few seconds at least but i know it had a great impact which arm was that the left arm Oh, it was the right right arm, arm. Right, arm and right, right arm that was a fascinating video i'm going to b-roll that on this video while we are talking about it so that was an interesting uh, encounter i was thrilled to see that i was shocked and um, you know i'll hear about that in a little detail but can we uh, speak about shalege banda chirute mattu itara kathegalu this beautiful kannada book what what do you have to uh, tell us about this so that i can ask people to get a copy of this 
See, as you rightly said earlier, you know, is science reaching the masses? Right. You know? Is it reaching the policy makers? So my, my whole idea is that if it has to reach the masses, it has to come out in local languages. Correct. So all the science we do, put it in a simple language, understandable language, so that common man reads what is behind their own backyard. Right. And also political leaders can, it's not that all political leaders are bad. Right. There are a few people who are interested to read, who want to do something good for the society. So if you reach out to them in, an, in, a, in a medium through which they understand very mm. easily mm. Uh, and it generates interest, mm. you know, there'll be a lot more support for wildlife conservation. Absolutely. Hence, that's the reason I've also been writing articles and books in Kannada. Right. And uh, of course, Shala Given the Chirte Matu Itara Kategolo has been one of the uh, best-selling books even for the publisher. Right. Uh, it sold out, I think the first edition sold out within two months after publication. Fantastic. And uh, there have been very nice reviews and... Uh, the most satisfying thing is when people from far off places in the Western Guards call me mm. and say, Sir, in Pustaka Vodde, it was such a pleasure to read. <laughs> and people connect to the book because there are names of villages from where, you know, they come from. Right. Or there are names of peaks they would have gone to, you know, gone for, taken, you know, gone to, climbed up to go to school. Right. So there are a lot of local uh, uh, flavor to it. So people love it a lot. Right. Because they can connect to it very, very easily. Absolutely. So talking about this particular uh, book, right, I'm guessing the hero of the multiple stories here was that Shalage Banda Chirte. So uh, we have all seen this video, multiple people's mobile phone videos and a lot of news channels and stuff like that. So I'd love to know about this episode from the horse's mouth. How did it happen? We saw there was a CCTV footage of the leopard walking in the school in the night. Right. So please tell us a little bit about this, sir. <laughs> That's something, you know, it's an interesting story. Uh, it was a Sunday afternoon for some strange reasons when leopards end up in um, in human dwell, uh, you know, highly human dense areas or inside a building in a school or in a factory. It somehow happens to be a lot of times on a Sundays, you know, mm -hmm. Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So okay. it was another typical Sunday afternoon. For some strange reason, I was I, I'm not a big uh, fan of. Um, movies, right? Uh, typical movies. I love <laughs> other kind of movies, you know, the right. art kind of movies. But that afternoon, I was watching a very typical Kannada uh, Sri Murali's movie, and then I got a call from the forest department, right? And said, you know, sir, uh, can you please come and help? There's a leopard in the school. I see. Uh, in in the eastern part, in Whitefield, right? The, the school called Vibgaya. Right. So I landed up there for some strange coincidence. Everything worked out, you know. You book a Ola, he hmm. he calls you and says, "Sir, I'm right at your doorsteps. Can we reach?" There's no traffic. Imagine going to reaching Whitefield in in a normal weekday from Banshankri. From Banshankri, right? Then I reached Whitefield. I think within 25 minutes from Banshankri. Hmm. So something strange and coincidence was happening, and when I reached the school. Uh, no, I was understanding the anatomy of the school because you want to secure the place first before you can capture the leopard. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people curious on the first. I saw the video. And uh, another thing which was in my mind when I walked into the school was I had seen an empty field and there were children playing in the field oh because of a Sunday afternoon. Right. And that was in my mind. You know, right. I, I, I was very clear that the leopard should not get into the field because right. the leopard is also panicked. Um, its um, uh, hormone levels are very high, then it just goes on a rampage of uh, you know, clawing people, it, mm. which can be very dangerous. Right. So uh, we were planning, we were discussing with the, the, the officials and we had planned certain things, but the impediment was media. Right. A huge number of media people standing trying to cover the event. Mm -hmm. So I was requesting the media to clear out from that place, mm -hmm. but something went wrong inside the building, inside the bathroom where the leopard was sitting. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I heard a big growl. Right. Uh, and I just turned back and I saw this huge, uh, this ventilator out of which this leopard was jump flying out basically, <laughs> oh my goodness. like a like a bird. And within a few seconds, it uh, you know caught up with me. Mm. And I was very aware of the children I was talking to you, sure. telling you earlier. And I didn't want the leopard to get out of the compound. Right. If it was outside the compound, the children would have been uh, probably, injured, exactly. you know, probably. Uh, so I and the veterinarian, we were very clear that the leopard should not get out of the school compound. Right. So we, I had to come in between the leopard and the leopard going out of the, uh, out of the school. Right. That's when the injuries happened. Right. Uh, and all the other... Um, really a very strange incident. After that, what happened? We don't see the entire video. It went into some... I think it went inside the swimming pool's uh, room or something and then it was tranquilized and relocated, I'm uh, yeah. guessing. 
Yeah, you know, typically like any leopard, it went into the changing room and then we tranquilized it, captured it. But very um, surprisingly, exactly one week after the leopard, that particular leopard was captured and it was uh, kept in captivity in Banergatana, uh, you know, biological park. Mm -hmm. It surprisingly and very strangely escaped from the uh, wow. from the zoo itself. I see. Like any, you know, ghost Amazing. leopard would do, uh, which is very nice because the animal is back in its uh, in its habitat now. Right. And right. I hope it's it continues to survive and thrive well in its habitat. I now. hope so too. You know, I've been visiting Nagarhole, Bandipura and of course many parts of India, photographed leopards for 14, 15 years. But I never had a chance to photograph the Black Panther. Mm -hmm. um, and only in 2020, because I'm not able to fly to different parts of the country and the world, I started going to Kabini again and again. One of a, one of the teenagers on my tour started saying, Oh, ni matra Black Panther idya. Then I said, Oh my goodness, I don't have something. And I started focusing on it. And uh, in a few weeks, I had the fortunate uh, encounter of the Black Panther. So have you been lucky to uh, get to see it, the Black Panther? Unfortunately, I've never seen a black leopard in my life. I see. Though I have been to places where black leopards, you know, Anji Dandeli is supposed to have right. high numbers of black leopards, you know, about fifth, half the population of uh, leopards in Anchi Dandeli or Kali Tiger is what it is called today. Right. It's supposed to be black. Right. But I've never seen a black leopard in my life. Uh, if possible, sir, someday if you have free time, I'd love to take you to Kabini and maybe yeah. hear about leopards while seeing it with you. Absolutely. <laughs> that would be a pleasure. I have a few more questions. Um, so, um, I, I would love to know about your new book, which is upcoming, The Leopard Diaries. Mm -hmm. What's going to be in it? As it tells, it's um, it's uh, the experiences about leopards. Mm -hmm. It's a work we did on leopards, the mm -hmm. conservation of leopards, and uh, how leopard is being threatened due to human impacts. So, if you see, there are tons of books on tigers. You know, there are tons of books on tiger behavior, tiger ecology, various aspects of tigers. But if you talk about leopards in India, there's very little to read for a common man to read about the myth about leopard, including about black leopards, right. or to understand the species itself, because sure. it's such a mysterious species. But despite that, very despite the fact that it's a widespread species, it's very mythical. Right. right. So it's all about leopards. It's all about uh, leopard behavior. But it also has the human angle. It also has uh, experiences of our journeys into the leopard world. It could be a small eatery somewhere right. uh, in uh, next to a forest right. where, where I have experienced some of the best masala doses there. <laughs> so it combines leopard, right. people, uh, ecology, landscape, or politics, all this. Things. Sure, fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm making a wild guess. Was there that Bandipur's baby if part of this book or was that something which is a small incident in yours? No, it's not, unfortunately. Okay, not all right. Because I, when I was growing up, I used to hear about that leopard quite a lot. But the yeah. leopard at Vibgar school is certainly part of it. Oh, that. fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. So, um, one of the amazing things you've been working on and I have also been involved in some ways is your community-based work. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I know that you've uh, had a lot of work done in the uh, Malai Mahadeshwara hill side um, of, uh, you know, um, uh, the place there with the you know, I think tribals of that area and you've also been involved in producing some products like the masks that we have been promoting to a lot of people in the past. So please tell us, um, why is it that um, community-based wildlife conservation initiatives are very important? And, um, you know, I'll tell you an example why I'm asking this. When I take new people to wildlife mm -hmm. safaris, let's say we are in Bisilwadi Kere and waiting for a leopard and suddenly there is... Uh, a tribal gang coming out of the bush with, um, you know, they are maybe honey collectors, Jainu Kurubas, they're coming out. And the feeling all these urban wildlifers get is, hey, why are they in the tourism zone? Because of them, I'm leopard sighting, we won't get anything here. But then if you start thinking about it, um, it is their place and they're uh, born and brought up there. So from a science and conservation perspective, how do scientists look at um, the local communities and why do you think it's important to work with them? See, some of the landscapes, you know, you can't have human-free uh, wildlife areas. So there are, one size does not fit all kind of uh, atmosphere is what wildlife conservation is all about. In MM Hills and Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuaries, where we have been working very extensively in the last one decade, also has huge number of local population. Right. People who have been, who have brought, born and brought up there. Right. So you have to work with them to see if we can minimize the impacts on wildlife. 
So hence you need to come come out with solutions which are conducive and amicable both for people and wildlife. Right. So that has been one of our goals in MM Hills and Kaveri landscape. We have been working now, and uh, some of them are dependent on forest produce for their livelihoods. Right. So you can't just say you know please get away from it because wildlife need it. Right. So you need to come out with solutions which is acceptable to them, mm-hmm. but which also benefits them to continue their livelihoods. Absolutely. So that has been one of the projects we have been involved with in the right. recent past. Right. Right. Fantastic. Also, you've been involved with projects where there was uh, um, a lot of effort needed from the conservation community to stop traffic in mm-hmm. national parks where, you know, um, there used to be night traffic and a lot of road kills and stuff like that. So is that something which is being implemented in a larger scale? Uh, I know that we uh, have the Bandipur Uti Highway, which is now not yeah. not uh, open for, uh, you know, vehicles night in the night traffic. Um, I do see in Kabini, uh, that is Nagar Hole. Also, they implemented it in a part of it. But I do I, I do know that um, even during the day, there's a huge amount of traffic which passes through the Manantwadi Highway. Yeah. And uh, the last two months, I've had uh, the black, uh, I mean, sorry, the backwater female and yeah. her cubs um, struggling to cross from A zone to B zone with some 50 vehicles on the road, 25 of them being uh, banana transport vehicles and stuff coming from... Um, uh, Kerala. Uh, so, um, is there a possibility for that road to be um, looked at? Is there an alternate path for uh, uh, transport to uh, be looked at? Or do you think that's the best we could have done from the Nagarhole side? See, the Mysore Manatwadi road is an extremely important case study. Mm. In the first time, <laughs> about uh, in the mid and late 90s, when I used to go there, uh, it was a very quiet road, you know, road with very minimal traffic. The road was very narrow, you know, perhaps about 10 feet uh, wide. So I remember very well, it was uh, May 1998, and I was returning from my morning's work on the Mysore Manatwadi road, which was a very small, narrow road at that point of time. And a leopard crossed the road. Mm. And uh, like typical cat, it stood on one side of the road and was looking back at something. Mm-hmm. It was not looking at me, which was different right. uh, than the leopard behavior. Then uh, I was wondering what it was. After a few minutes, seconds actually, mm-hmm. Two young cubs crossed the road. Right. And I was very fascinated, you know, always you know, when you see leopards or the young ones, it's very fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I drove away. Mm. And the same evening, almost at the same location when I was coming back from, after my evening's work, right. a tiger was walking on the road, right. on the Mysore Manat Road. Wow. Mm-hmm. I switched off the vehicle and I started walking behind it for a while. And uh, it was very pleasant. There was no traffic on that road. I walked behind that uh, tiger for about one, one and a half kilometers Mm -hmm. before it veered off into the, into a trail inside the forest and went away. Mm -hmm. And that night I started thinking, I saw two cats in the same day. That two in the nineties. Yeah. (laughs) And with two uh, young cubs. And what would happen to these animals? How would they cross this road and walk on this road if the traffic increased on this road sometime? Mm. So that became a seed in my head, which right. went on eating my head for a very long time. And then finally in 2008, you know, we managed to get that road closed at night time. Right. That was because of one very uh, forward thinking, pro-conservation uh, Indian Administrative Services officer called Mr. Manivarnan, right. who supported what we had proposed to him. And mm. then uh, the night uh, vehicular traffic was closed right. and it continued. Then it was the first step. We just didn't stop there. Mm-hmm. We got a part of the road, <clears throat> if you know that road very well, from Daman Kate to Udbur, Udbur. Kudu, mm-hmm. what is called Udur, Udbur Kud Raste, okay. mm-hmm. that was also inside the Tiger Reserve earlier. Absolutely. What now people call as the old MM road, or, you know, where you see from a lot the, of, From the T-junction. Uh, exactly, right. Mm-hmm. That's the tourism uh, co- terminologies which have been coined today. <laughs> that part was also inside the Tiger Reserve and there right. was a lot of vehicles on that road. Sure. That road, we ensured that it was rerouted mm. and uh, you know decommissioned inside the tiger reserve mm-hmm. and then brought out Absolutely. out of the tiger reserve so the road which you uh, drive from damankate to karapura to jungle lodges right. which is very beautiful now was right. a very horrible road Absolutely. and we worked with the state government and convinced the chief minister who sure. actually uh, gave 18 crores to do that road outside the tiger reserve wow. which was about 10 kilometers. Right. That was the first instance mm. or a first example in this country right. where a road was decommissioned mm. for 
the purpose of wildlife conservation absolutely, absolutely. and that set a trend that right. set a example so based on that you know roads through bandipur now two highways through bandipur was mm. closed similar examples exist now because after these examples you know people close the road through gir at night time wow. through velavadar national park so that set a you know that's something precedence, yeah. the precedent it yeah. set a precedence for mm. a lot of other areas absolutely. and people talk about closure of night traffic in protected areas today absolutely absolutely i remember uh, in 2003 4 i used to drive uh, from damanketa all the way mm-hmm. to um, you know this t junction and go yeah. back um, and uh, that was a different excitement but at night i'm sure there'll be a lot of trucks and even now from udbur kudu to i think balle yeah it's still uh, even though at 6 o'clock i mean i think uh, there's still a lot of traffic because they're all rushing out yeah. i hope that stretch gets some kind of respite some day i don't i don't think there's any op- uh, option to reroute from there right because there's a water unfortunately because there's no alternative you know because mm. in wildlife conservation you always have to provide alternatives absolutely if you, if you go with an answer to a political leader and tell this is what we don't want but this is what is available right. they're more amenable to listen to you it's absolutely. like you know don't use a camera or mm. particular brand of camera and mm. then you'll ask me what is the alternative absolutely so that's how we you Uh, can do a lot for conservation right. instead of just breastfeeding right so uh, unfortunately because the roads through bandipur are closed mm-hmm. and the alternative route for bandipur is the road which passes from hunsur to titimati mm. at night times right so all of this pass through some amount of uh, forested landscapes of wildlife course. habitats right. but you need to have a compromise where you where you stop wildlife conservation where human uh, welfare gets priority right. or where wildlife conservation gets priority Absolutely. so instead of having roads through the core of a tiger reserve mm-hmm. it's better to have a road at the edge of a tiger reserve True. or a forest sure. habitat makes sense sir makes sense so uh, this is one question which is um, a little tough for me to ask because it's uh, um, you know it's from my own uh, business perspective mm-hmm. so um, I, I while I always know that vyaparam droha chintanam <laughs> but I still want to ask this because I don't think it has to be entirely droha chintanam yeah. um what is your opinion on the growing wildlife tourism sector because I I have seen it grow in my own business where a very mm-hmm. small company um but in the last 10 years of our existence it's grown immensely and we only see it growing everywhere in the country in different parts of the world what's um a wildlife conservation scientists perspective on these bangalore bombay wildlife enthusiasts wearing camouflage shirts rushing to the kabinis bandipurs bhadras of the world on a friday morning how do you uh, people in the fraternity of conservation see this ever growing interest in wildlife see tourism per se is not a bad thing right uh, well maintained well implemented well organized tourism is certainly is going to benefit wildlife because it's going to bring in or it should bring in uh, jobs and employment for local communities uh, local nature guides you know drivers uh, resort i i i hope some day it will be the local people who will be owning resorts around bandipur nagrohale around badra or any other place around tambur etc etc right so it brings in economy it brings in cash for people to uh, to encourage and support wildlife conservation but unfortunately the the distribution of this economy is very narrow mm. so what i would expect is you are not just going to these areas to watch these animals they are not just subjects they are not just recreational items you know you also need to see them from a perspective of there are species which are threatened which need to be conserved right so first thing is we need to understand them right uh, it's not just a recreational aspect like you go to a movie but you also understand the the moral behind the movie right. the entertainment behind the movie mm. and you uh, take the good things back your back right. to your home that's Absolutely. what we need to do with tourism as well Absolutely. we need better educated tourists uh educated in the in sense of nature educated tourism sure, we have sure. tourism i understand so i always uh, try to see how we can make this a little more holistic because you know we get a lot of uh enthusiasts who want to see the li- leopard mm-hmm. or tiger but then um it's also a responsibility of a tour company like ours where we need to give them the holistic education mm-hmm. of a national park like for, for example the teak wood in yeah. nagarhole or different species not just the leopard or the black panther not just the a zone and stuff like that uh, it's a challenge for us because we need to maintain the interest in the business the big cats yeah. and all of that at the same time also uh, try to see how we can push our undercurrent agenda of uh, nature education conservation mindset and stuff like that so i must admit we have a long way to go from our own perspective there sir um one one question related to tourism itself 
I remember uh, a few years ago you uh, I probably went to Kenya for some I don't know maybe a lecture or something you were uh, giving there and you took a small sidekick trip with your family to the Masai Mara National Park um so it's very interesting for me to ask somebody like you who is a hardcore scientist who has been to Africa and what are your big observations between the Indian context let's say Karnataka to be precise maybe Ranthambore Bandavgarh kind of places how um has it been for you to compare Africa and uh mm. india from the wildlife tourism sector it's uh, not just about kenya you know mm. you go to namibia you go to south africa one thing which really hits you is the vastness of the landscape right. and the low human density right um that's that's a bigger natural advantage they have mm. um we can't emulate that in 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 any way in in this country right. but we can certainly follow certain or some of the good things they follow there like very strict protocols with tourism there right and everybody follows uh those protocols very strictly right number one number two i was very impressed with the quality of nature guides they have right you know he is also your driver he is also a person who um, uh who collaborates with the lodge you're staying and uh, your needs right. but he is also a nature guide with enormous amount of knowledge True. about all species found in that area if not all species but at least many of the species he's he's also a good birder right. he he's also a good her, you know herpetologist True. he can identify explain new things he can also talk to you about ecosystem function absolutely you know that is what uh, really impressed me about uh, those nature guides right. i think that's something which which are good uh, lessons which we need to bring in right. and follow it and implement in this country i know it's very difficult because of the socio cultural aspect of the tourists we get here in this country True. and even in this country because a lot of people even in african safaris you know they complain about the noise we you know uh, and Great. our fondness for food when we are on safaris <laughs> but uh, i think that can be inculcated in people sure sure i mean i have I have been uh, thriving on africa tourism mm-hmm. apart from india so it was curious uh, question from my personal side um thank you very much for that uh, i have a few more questions about some conservation issues mm-hmm. like um leopard for example right it's probably the least known big cats uh, with respect to you know many things from habitat to its threats and stuff like that but i do notice that um i read in one of your ncf reports mm-hmm. uh, when i was going through a lot of uh, reports that you have published at least the introduction um that uh, leopards falling into open wells is uh, an amazing number of leopards in fact i i don't remember the exact percentage but it was substantial number of leopards which fall into open wells and uh, is that something which is a thing of the past because we don't probably use wells like before now or is it still uh, very um, much the way it is it's a very current topic okay you know leopards falling into these open wells because they just need not be wet well you know wells with water but they can also be dry dry wells, wells. Mm. so there are a lot of leopards which fall into these dry wells or uh, or wells with water which needs to be rescued or mm-hmm. some of them die unfortunately mm-hmm. but it also depicts that perhaps the species is also distributing and getting into areas which where it was not found earlier for so many uh, ecological reasons right so our study showed very well especially in karnataka that it is coming it's a upcoming threat mm-hmm. and we need to address that in 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 the right sense right. because if we are thinking of leopard and human coexistence mm-hmm. in human dominated landscape it's one of the threats we certainly needs to address absolutely absolutely and uh, how is uh, the situation with road kills and mm-hmm. um, i also think retaliatory killings was one of the things you mentioned about yeah. leopard threats because you know it goes to a village hundreds of people mob the yeah. leopard stone it you know hit it with all kinds of things is that something which is changing or is it still a risky thing in rural side uh, i don't know even in cities maybe it is the same um, what what's your opinion on that uh, first if you're talking about road kills you know mortality of leopards due to speeding vehicles or any kind of vehicle yes it's a serious threat because uh, we are our roads network is expanding mm. you know by the year 2050 we will have 50 million new kilometers of roads wow. in this world and 50% of it is going to be in the brics countries you know brazil russia india china and south africa i see so all these roads are going to some of go is certainly going to go through some of our natural habitats which contains leopards absolutely and with increased technology 
you know, vehicles which are much faster today, which you can drive through from Bangalore to Mysore at much higher speed. The highway is becoming bigger and easier for transportation. Some of these animal wildlife species, including leopards, are greater threat. Right. So we need to come out with infrastructure development, which is wildlife friendly. Right. Perhaps in some areas, we need to identify wildlife crossings and build structures so that it, you know, animals have a way to move from one end of the habitat to the other section of the habitat. Right. Similarly, retaliatory killing, it's a, it's a very unfortunate thing because um, until and unless we give solution to human leopard conflict, right. this is going to increase in the coming days because sure. people also are dependent on livelihoods on the sheep and goat mm -hmm. on which leopards are going to prey on. Right. So we need a sustainable solution for this. Right. Okay, sir. I have uh, another question related to Kabini because that's one of my favorite places mm -hmm. and I'm sure you have had a lot of experience there. I remember the very first time I went to Kabini, uh, the, one of the lodges manager asked me, what's your expectation? When I said I'm a wildlife photo enthusiast, which was very new back then, mm -hmm. 2004. He asked me, what are, what's, what's your expectation? I said, uh, I would love to see elephants. Mm -hmm. And he was surprised. And he said, usually people ask tiger, tiger, and you're saying elephants. And I remember that very trip in the Golgar of the lodge, there was a board which said, in the summer, in Kabini, you will not find a single elephant. Mm -hmm. And after a full stop and a line break, it said, you will see hundreds, right? Mm -hmm. And that particular trip was my uh, birthday in the month of May. I remember in the whole week, I was the only guest in Kabini, which is like a dream now. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. And uh, during the fourth day, every afternoon was a boat safari. Every mm -hmm. morning was a jeep safari. Because, you know, we wouldn't miss anything by going on the boat because we wouldn't see much in the jeep anyway. Yeah. So, but in the boat, you would see so many elephants. Mm -hmm. On that particular day, I had uh, a naturalist called Harsha. Um, he's also a very prominent naturalist. We counted 540 elephants on a boat safari. Oh. 2005 May, I think. Fantastic. 540 elephants. Because all we did that day was counting herds 20, 15, 16. And 540 elephants by the time we came back. It's history now. Yeah. So I just want to know from your opinion, what could be some possible reasons that has happened? Yeah, you have rightly said, you know, we have lost that uh, congregation, what used to be called as the elephant congregation on the backwaters of Kabini. If you see this film, uh, Nagarhule, Tales of an Indian Jungle by Jungle she by Shekhar, Shekhar Dattatri, Dattatri. Hmm. Uh, he says, you know, the, the elephant congregation in Nagarhule is over hmm. when it starts, month, uh, starts raining. Right. It's very much true now. Unfortunately, that congregation has stopped. Right. It is because all these elephants, either from Bandipur or Nagarhule and far off other places, this is a large landscape, hmm. which includes Mudumalai, which perhaps elephants are coming from BRLs, MMLs, towards Nagarole, Bandipur during mm. summer mm. when they would all congregate around Kabini. Right. Or even from north of Nagarole. Right. When water used to be scarce in other parts of the uh, landscape or right. elephant habitat, they would all come and congregate on the backwaters of Kabini. Mm -hmm. What has happened over the years is that there's a lot of creation of surface water tanks in the entire landscape. Oh, I see. You know, water holes have been dug in, mm. in large numbers. Nagarole perhaps has one or two water holes for every square kilometer. Oh, I see. So that is perhaps one of the most important ecological reason mm. why animals have stopped moving towards Kabini when the water sure. uh, is at short in other parts of the... Or perhaps water is not sh at short at all, mm -hmm. scarce mm -hmm. at all. Right. And mm. even some of the places, they have used solar water pumps to pump out water and keeps the tanks fill even during the summer. Right. In my opinion, this is not a great thing. I see. Because mm. elephants by nature have to move, mm. have to migrate. Mm. Uh, during that long migration, during the summer periods or dry periods, mm. the, the weak ones, the young ones will all die. Right. And that keeps the, uh, more, more, you know, the Mortality population mm. at, at a stable level, at a, sustain, a sustainable mm. level. Right. But if you give, and elephants don't have natural enemies like you know, right. except for, you know. The Last week there was a tiger, but calf, it was an yeah, exception. <laughs> but exceptions, you know, at exceptional circumstances, tigers pick up the calves. Right. Otherwise, food, a fodder and water are the two limiting factors for elephant population. Mm. But you're not increasing the natural habitat, but you're just artificially augmenting population of elephants by providing water in an artificial manner. Right. right. Uh, elephants cannot live on an apartment complex Absolutely. like, you know, one Absolutely. above the other. So until and unless the natural habitats increase, mm. this provisioning of water through mm. artificial means has to stop. Right. 
that increases conflict and has a lot of negative impact on the farmers outside the in the you know outside nagarole and bandipur right. and that impacts wildlife in turn I see. you know farmers go and retaliate right. you know there is electrocution of elephants Absolutely. there's uh, summers you know the you have forest fires right. due to retaliation True. so we need to understand animals from its ecological perspective True. you should not anthropocize animals thinking that animals need water we need mm. to go and feed True. Water, True. animals water sure. so if you think like that what about the trees and plants mm. will you go and uh, you know water, water plant. every plant and tree in nagarol and bandipur sure, during summer sure. we should not anthropocize mm. animals have evolved over millions of years and they know how to survive right some right. may die which is a natural process like you right. know humans die right but i think that's one of the major reasons too much of surface water in the landscape now mm. has stopped this migration and movement towards kabinina interesting one of the things i have learned in my limited exposure to wildlife and very very limited to conservation sir is a lot of us have great passion and intent but you know it reminds me of a road to disaster paved with good intentions yes, which exactly. is why speaking to people like you who understand not just the passion for conservation but also the science and the rational for Uh, what's right and what's not mm-hmm. to be uh, implemented so that's where i think it's important for us to you know have conversations with people like you so that we can spread across the right messages so thank you for that it was an interesting observation um so does that also say why the big cat sightings in places like nagarhole has increased over time because i remember in that one week in 2005 I had one lep- leopard and one fleeting tiger mm-hmm. and today in a week you can see 25 tigers and some 10 leopards and including a black panther if you're lucky <laughs> what has changed sir one is of course tourism has increased you know animals have got used to vehicles uh, animals have got used to people in a in a to tolerate people and um, vehicles as well that is one aspect of it the second aspect of it we have modified the habitat to su- suit tourism needs oh. you know the the view lines right. the lines you know beyond the the vegetation beyond our safari roads have increased over years and right. years so first it used to be 5 meters on either side 20 of the road now, now then it went to 10 meters then 15 and then so on hmm. so there's much more open area for for people to view animals right. and like i said earlier there's lot more surface water lot more tanks available sure. where you can wait and the animals come there to drink hmm. water hmm. so tourism has certainly has uh, uh, the the increase in tourism has also increased the number of sightings in these areas because sure. animals have just got used to people right. and vehicles so the deweeding sir i have a question is that only lantana or is that all species of trees and plants will be deweeded for 20 meters on either sides unfortunately all species oh. so that is why if you drive and if you carefully notice in some parts of nagarhole and bandipur especially the tourism areas mm-hmm. you will not see uh, old mature trees in the tourism zone right. especially in those areas where that have been deweeded oh, okay. you'll only see young saplings and no regeneration happening in those I areas see. interesting and and is a lantana problem which i know since the last 15 years i've been seeing people in bandipur mm-hmm. doing research on it and is there any progress which is substantial to an extent where we might see the the solution to this problem because I have been to many parts of India mm-hmm. but somehow our parks of Nagarhole Bandipur seems to be the best in Lantana. Mm-hmm. Yeah they have they're best in Lantana like you say there is high uh, density of lantana in some parts of these parts but also mind it they also have high density of prey species and tigers. Right. So to be very honest I don't think it is directly affecting you know tiger population or large uh, mammal population. Right. It may be affecting vegetation mm. it may be affecting certain kind of uh, tree species and plant species right. about which we are not uh, very sure about what it is affecting. Right. But it has become such a mammoth issue today mm. I don't think we can actually weed out lantana oh, in the current circumstances at the scale it has uh, grown. I see. Mm. Experiments have been carried out in South Africa in Australia in South America in so many parts of the world mm. they have been unable to eradicate lantana right. so they it becomes at some point of time you should say okay we accept it as a species which mm. is not welcome mm. but we are unable to deal with this problem mm. Mm. and it is you know something which is a necessary evil you just right. let it go like sure. i myself have uh, a fantastic image of uh, the arli katte male in bandipur mm. which is using the lantana to stalk Okay. and um, the the spotted deer was about 20 feet away and the tiger is uh, stalking the uh, spotted deer mm-hmm. lantern was a useful thing for that tiger that day <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so you also do a lot of, um, I think you teach in NCBS, mm-hmm. uh, Wildlife Institute of India, and also I heard that Kuempu uh, University. Mm-hmm. What what subjects do you um, teach in these places? Uh, NCBS, I don't, I know NCBS or WI or Kuempu, whoever invi- has invited in the past or invite even now. I teach conservation biology. I teach this uh, interface between society and conservation. I teach how can people achieve conservation success stories within the current scenario within the current political system right. i also try and teach conservation communication right. you know how do you communicate to people why is it necessary to communicate right. biology and in what are the best methods to communicate conservation biology or ecology to people right. that's my core strength of teaching right sir i have an interest i don't know how how is it possible maybe you can you know make it happen through ncf which of course is an organization i know for a very long time um and that brings me to my one of the last penultimate questions um i probably have taught more than you know few thousand newbie wildlife photographers wow. uh, and my organization has taught more than 10000 newbie photographers Fantastic. it's on record okay so somewhere we feel apart from teaching them photography we have to an extent failed to you know inculcate a lot more um you know what can i say conservation mindset or let's say uh, being responsible to risk and stuff like that mm-hmm. so there are a lot of people who have uh, moved beyond a sharp photos mm-hmm. requirement to thinking about the next question mm-hmm. what can they do how can they be involved how can their beautiful uh, pretty pictures as the conservation community calls it um, how can they move beyond it how can their photos be used to serve larger goals um any advice to uh, people who are starting wildlife photography how they can be involved what are some very common things they can do to make sure they really contribute apart from contributing to image databases see when we grew up if you wanted to see nice pictures of wildlife and you have to pick up national geographic in hard copy right? right and those were there were amazing images of wildlife across the world hmm. and most of these wildlife photographers were mostly from north america or right. from europe correct and today i'm very proud and happy that hmm. we have some of the best wildlife photographer from india hmm. you know from karnataka from right. bangalore i'm right. very proud about it you know sure. i walk into your office and i see beautiful pictures of puma hmm. in patagonia hmm. you wouldn't have seen this you know right. 20 years ago true i'm very proud about it you know but at the same time i think if photographers went beyond like you said the hmm. pretty picture hmm. and said i want to work hmm. i'm not just seeing this leopard or a tiger or an elephant as a subject but mm. i see it as a species mm. which needs my support right. and how can i contribute sure. can i work with scientists to, to show that i can also contribute to conservation in my own way mm. uh, like you have done uh, to our organization to mm. support and promote some of our products right. or within your own teaching you know you get scientists to talk about wildlife conservation right um though it may it may look like a bit of deviation mm. but that's very much necessary that we can say right. let's talk about conservation right. uh, to photographers as well Absolutely. but i'm sure you know if people were exposed to that kind of mindset like mm. this initiation of yours to get me mm. into into talk about conservation which which is a purely a photographic organization right. to talk about conservation itself shows you know there are interested people who would like to do it thank you very much thank you looking forward to that sir so um <coughs> will there be some kind of uh, a possibility for an organization like ncf to come up with let's say um, you know a weekend program in conservation for the common man because yep. this could be a software engineer who'd never be a um, never be wanting to go to ncbs and study biology yep. but you know um, do you think there are such initiatives where common man and you know uh, students and professionals can learn about conservation from scientists and biologists it could be a paid program which would also yep. be a revenue stream for organization yep. like ncf um is there something which we can expect but i really think it's a good idea to do that no that's something which i have been mulling about for a while now because i think we finally need uh, dummies for conservation right um uh, i think you know with the digital media expanding so much with internet being more available to people mm-hmm. and uh, classes being held online for mm-hmm. various subjects i think conservation needs to be brought down to a common man right. and i'm sure you know if we work together with people who have the right techniques and mm-hmm. the right uh, 
talent to do digital uh, digital um, uh, medium to bring out conservation to people sure. i think it's certainly a good idea great idea mm. and i would be personally very happy to get into that right. and that's something which i have been thinking you know with so many people interested in wildlife as a tourist or as a photographer or as a conservation enthusiast i think it's time that we bring this as a structured learning for people sure and uh, if there's anything i can do because i have a lot of customers who are wildlife enthusiasts mm-hmm. and uh, if if we can I, i don't even know if we can take this offline and discuss some kind of a collaboration i'll be happy to discuss that uh, it's been uh, fascinating i think i'm i'm through with all the questions though i know i can keep talking to you for you know days together looking forward to more such interactions and uh, i would probably ask you the last question is there any advice you would like to give to uh, wildlife enthusiasts photographers uh, anybody interested in the well-being of this uh, planet and ecology environment we just saw david attenborough's uh, you know movie on netflix mm-hmm. a few days ago everybody has that fresh in their mind any closing comments or advice from you sir see what is very important like said uh, like i said earlier is to have an ethics for wildlife mm-hmm. you know you can be a photographer you can be a tour guide you can be a lodge owner you can be anyone uh, who is reaping benefits out of wildlife conservation uh, out of wildlife right. including scientists right. because our salaries come because this wildlife exists true so if we need to keep wildlife conservation ethics above everything else right right uh, you need to follow ethical practices which is very important sure so like i said earlier if i go to you know if i retire some day i look back i should not have that guilt that oh i had such a long time in my life i mm. did so much mm. you know i went out and did all these beautiful photographs but did i really contribute back to the species from which i made all this name fame and you know whatever i did from right that guilt feeling should not be there with you when you retire right i have such an amazing thought thank you very much sir it was a pleasure talking to you and i think um, i have had a lot of education in this conversation and i hope our viewers will get to you know mull over a lot of thoughts and maybe they would uh, identify areas in which they can fine tune their interest they already are great passionate wildlife photo mm-hmm. enthusiasts all they probably need to do is now uh, orient themselves towards some causes and maybe use their interest to probably do something better for the larger community and uh, wildlife and ecology thank you very much thank you i know as we come to the end of 2020 and we look forward into 21 um, I wish all the viewers and all the followers of Giant and to hold uh, the very best in this new year. I hope uh, 2021 will be a lot lot better with a lot of nice wildlife memories to all of you. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So guys, if you enjoyed this um, conversation, I I'll be surprised if you didn't. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to this channel and I promise you I'll try my best to bring more such eminent personalities not only in photography but wildlife conservation maybe different forms of um, you know the world of wildlife and stuff like that so I'd look forward to your support thank you very much for watching us stay tuned bye